Okay, good morning, Macna, day three. Glad to see you're all up. Um, it's my pleasure to get to introduce Jamie Craigs this morning. If you were at the banquet last night, Jamie is our Mazna Aquarius of the Year. Uh, he is the curator of the uh, aquarium at the uh, Hornum Museum and Gardens in London, and also a PhD student at the University of Derby, and of course, uh, the first person who's really getting corals to spawn in captivity. Uh, his talk today is in uh, the H Project Coral, an overview of five years of aquarium-based broadcast coral spawning research and goals for the future. Let's welcome Jamie. Cool. Cheers. Uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm going to um, talk about some work we've been doing over uh, the last five, six years, um, focusing on getting broadcast corals to spawn in a very planned and predictable way. So um, I'll talk about some of the research a bit in uh, chronological order, um, and then also some of the projects I'm involved with where I can see hopefully this will play in a role in the aquarium industry, but also for reef restoration in the future. Um, so I work at uh, the Horniman Museum in Garnets. It's quite an old institution in London. Um, and it was set up by this guy, Frederick Horniman. Um, he was a Victorian tea trader. And he was fascinated by world culture, natural history. Um, and he built the museum and then handed it over as a free gift uh, to the people of London. Um, so it's been a free museum ever since then. Our first aquarium was put in in, in 1903. So we've got quite a long history of, um, of uh, aquariums within the institution. Um, and the first aquariums were f set up by this guy. Um, this guy is Philip Henry Goss. If you don't know about him, he is the godfather of aquariums. He wrote the first aquarium book in 1854 called Marine Aquarium. Bear in mind this guy had no running water, no electricity. He was keeping British native species going for a year at a time um, and really pioneered aquarium. The term aquarium, he invented that. Um, in the museum, it's gone through four iterations in that 115 years, uh, and I'm the curator of the, the, the most recent, uh, which was built about 12 years ago. It's very small. I can sprint around my aquarium in 12 seconds, so don't think it's, you know, it's, it's a small place. But um, what we sort of lack in size, we hopefully make up for in some of the work that we do behind the scenes. Um, I took over as cu uh, the curator there about 10 years ago, and for me, um, Managing a collection, in my mindset, we should always be trying to further our knowledge on husbandry. And so research, I think, is really important for public aquariums to do behind the scenes. And the thing that I've focused on in my career is looking at corals. Um, it's the things that fascinated me. And I suppose when um, you're keeping any animal, one of the ultimate goals is to try and breed those animals. So I set myself the goal of, of trying to spawn corals. Um, the... But before I sort of go on to that, I just want to briefly sort of touch on the reproductive modes of corals. So um, corals can sexually reproduce in, in two ways. There's two broad groups. Um, about 15% of um, all corals are what are called brooders. So they are internally fertilizing. Um, the embryos are developing inside the corals, and then they're releasing uh, larvae out into the aquariums or into the, into the water. And so Bacillopora damicornis is the sort of classic known one. It, it spawns in everyone's tanks. It's a bit of a weed. Uh, Tubastria cochinia, this one, the sun coral, is a brooder as well. Um, and brooders uh, are not necessarily uh, spawning in just these, these sort of mass spawns. They're producing these larvae throughout the whole year, often linked to the lunar cycle and in peaks and troughs of the amount they produce. Um, but then the biggest group are the broadcast spawners. And these are the sort of challenging ones that while they've been spawning events in public aquariums, home aquariums, they've always been accidental, unplanned events. Um, they are characterized by this sort of mass release of these gametes, um, often over one or two nights of the year. Um, they can behave either as a gonagoristic species, so they can have separate sexes. You have a male and a female colony, or they can be hermaphrodites where they're releasing um, both packages of eggs and sperm. So acroprids are all hermaphrodites. They're releasing these egg sperm packages. Um, and it's characterized by external fertilization, so that you have this mass release of gametes. Um, fertilization occurs externally, and then the embryos are developing up in the water, ultimately uh, form the larvae, which settles onto the reef and grows into a, a new polyp. And reefs can behave in different ways. They can either be synchronous spawning, so the Great Barrier Reef is probably the best known of that, uh, where, um, and certainly the best, um, most studied uh, reef, 
they uh, you know, have this mass spawning event where the whole community is going off over just a few nights of the year. Or they can act in an asynchronous pattern. So Kenya is an asynchronous spawning location where um, different colonies or different species might go over multiple months or staggered. So, um, and what I'm focusing on is the synchronous spawning locations because the idea behind that, we can pinpoint a moment in time when we know spawning is going to happen, and that's really important to then work backwards on that environmental parameters that we want to uh, replicate in aquariums. Um, so my initial goal was, you know, can I spawn them in a, in a planned way? And now taking that a step forward, the, the ultimate goal of Project Coral is, um, can we accelerate um, the number of spawns that happen in a single year? And if we can do that, does it then create a significant platform for these three key areas? So if, for instance, if we had 12 systems, could we manipulate a spawn and you have a, a spawn every month of the year? Um, and by doing that, um, can it support these, these areas? So there's big questions about where reefs are going to be in the future. We know reefs are uh, getting a lot of pressure. Um, and so studying reproduction is really important if we want to know how reefs can rebuild um, and rebound back from that. Um, the challenge is you've literally got a couple of nights a year to get the material to do your experimental work. The same is true for restoration. Um, using sexual reproduction to create new genetic material, um, you've got this very small window of time. So if we can increase that amount of time, we're increasing the amount of material, we can start answering some of these questions about upscaling restoration easier. And then obviously there's the aquarium trade. You know, um, lots and lots of corals are uh, um, asexually fragmented. It's a very sustainable way of, of producing corals. But there are obviously species that because of their biology, we can't asexually fragment them. So can sexual reproduction um, offer new opportunities to um, explore sexual reproduction and, uh, and sustainable production of, of some of these species that might be susceptible to overharvesting? So looking at... Um, since probably the early 80s, um, re uh, broadcast spawning events have been really well studied. There's lots and lots of scientific literature that um, uh, give us some indication about what triggers uh, the corals to spawn. Now, when I started thinking about this, you know, whether you're breeding a freshwater tetra in the Amazon or, or a shark in a public aquarium, the process is exactly the same. It's looking at what happens in the wild. Uh, that creates the right season for spawning or, or reproduction, and then you try and replicate that in our glass boxes. So why are broadcast corals any different? We just need to understand what makes them tick out in the wild and then provide that in, in the aquarium setup. And so th there's papers focusing on all of these, so everything from species-specific drivers, so different characteristics of different species, heterotrophic feeding is very important to give them the energy to produce the gametes. Um, then the seasonal temperature change seems to be the first trigger to start uh, the gametogenic cycle, so this, uh, this uh, development of the gametes of sperm and oocytes, the eggs. Um, there's been papers talking about the influence of regional wind fields, whether that um, simula uh, you know, pro provides a cue in terms of spawning. Solar radiation curves, so the elliptical movement of the Earth around the sun not only changes the photo period, but also the amount of photons that are hitting the Earth, because the Earth is closer or, or further away from the sun at set periods. Um, Kelvin temperature changes, and then take us right up to the lunar cycle. And so the, the thought is that all of these play a progressively finer scale um, of cues to trigger the corals to go in you know, these, these very small windows of time. And so, right at the very beginning, I'm going to chronologically sort of go through some bits. Um, this, this is the amount of space I have at the museum, a little corridor. Um, we do jellyfish reproduction all down this side. And then these were my original, um, this was my Mark I version of the, of the reef, uh, research tank. I was doing coral disease work in here, and then we just adapted it for, for coral spawning. So what we know is the interplay, uh, when we get closer to the spawning, the interplay between the photo period and the lunar cycle is really a very important thing that you need to control. And particularly, a uh, period of darkness following full moon. So each day we move past the full moon, as the sun is setting before the moon rises, this period of darkness increases by 50 minutes each day, around 50 minutes. And the corals that have... Um, uh, regulate themselves, the genes are regulated inside the body as a response to this period of darkness. So I've got you know, a system here, security guards can come in at night, turn these on. So I basically built Mordor, 
behind the scenes out of really chill building materials um, to basically control that whole light dark environment. Um, this was done on a real shoestring. This is the, the right at the beginning. But the initial goal is can we get this Acropora to spawn? Um, I had this Acropora valida um, genotype for about 15 years, um, and I had lots of pieces dotted all over different aquariums. I pulled all those together, glued them together on a rock, um, and allowed them to fuse back together. This is something called isogenetic fusion. These are all genetically exactly the same. And the thinking was at the time that size would be an important um, component uh, to allow them to reproduce. I don't think that is the case now, um, but this is the thinking at the time. So I basically built a big coral. Uh, I provided all this seasonal uh, parameters, and it worked. Eight months later, we had spawning corals. Um, the Valida was first, and then the following month, the Pastrata, that I, I approached the same process in that way. And so this really sort of allowed us to start thinking, we're onto something here. We're, we're providing this environmental cues, and it's, it's working. And then um, Dirk Peterson, who's the, the founder of Seacor um, International, and then now my, my, one of my PhD supervisors, James Guest, they came and visited me in, in 2013. And we were talking about this and saying, well, it's, it's great, but I have absolutely no idea where this came from originally in the world. I got it from a friend of mine, David Saxby's tank, 15 years ago. Where it came from in the world, we have no idea. So to make this actually scientifically valid, we need to start focusing on specific areas of the world, collecting corals from those areas, uh, collecting data from that area, and then replicating uh, initially in sync with the wild. So, that sort of led into uh, discussions at the end of 2013 and then into 2014. Um, so the two study sites I'm focusing on are, are Singapore, a reef in uh, just south of Singapore called Kusu Island, um, and then the Great Barrier Reef as well. And I'm initially focusing on acroprids. Um, so we work with the Singapore government to, to get corals and get permits to, to bring corals back from Singapore, and then Cairns Marine have been supplying us with corals from, from the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and the, the systems have become a lot more sophisticated as time has gone on. Um, that original uh, Mark I version, we're now on what we call Mark IV. Um, and these systems have been built by my good friend. I don't know if Vince is in here. Um, he is brilliant at building. There he is. Um, and so by focusing on specific areas of the world, I, I get data from those different locations from a different uh, number of sources. So whether it's probes I've put on the reef or I use NASA satellite data, um, to replicate all that seasonality. So seasonal temperature changes, um, the black dots here are where we have spawning activity in the aquariums, and this is a Singapore profile. We have the solar radiation curves there, and then this is what that solar radiation curve maps out like in Singapore. And what's interesting is um, you have a, a, an initial peak. This is by um, link to uh, the spring um, equinox, and then you have a secondary peak linked to the vernal equinox, the autumnal equinox. And this is related to how close uh, the Earth is to the sun. That's what's creating that pattern. And so there's been some speculation about whether this is part of the drivers of getting corals to spawn, or whether it's the seasonal temperature change. And it may be that it's not just one, it may be that they're both interplaying. Um, the problem with doing any work in the field is you can't disentangle that. So ex situ spawning allows us to do lots of experiments so we can understand this a little bit better. I need to thank um, Ecotech Marine and, and Triton. The, these two companies understood what I was trying to do about four years ago, and they've got behind me donating so much equipment um, that has enabled this to get so much more sophisticated than it ever was right at the beginning. Um, so thank you to them. Also, the Bush Gardens and uh, SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund have funded a lot of the construction of the systems, and again, it wouldn't be possible without them. So all of this data gets put into the microprocessor and, and replicates that seasonality. Um, and the idea, so I'm going back a slide, the idea, you know, what I want to try and do is where we're publishing papers, um, we're publishing it in something called open source journals. So lots of journals, you have to pay to get that paper. What we're trying to do is we pay the journal to make sure it's open source. So you can get all of this information and replicate this back at home. It gives you all the details of how to program. We're using Apex now. So it gives you all the information about how to go about and do that. Um, one of the papers that we, we published as well is about how to ship gravid colonies to start your brood stock. So this, this is uh, the, the situation in Singapore. 
like I say, we work with the Singapore. Whoops, we we um, work with the Singapore government. We were allowed to remove um, big pieces of hyacinthus from uh, 14 colonies on the reef in Kusu. We then marked up those colonies, so we had a map of where they were, and then the colony fragments. Um, uh, you know, had the same tag number, so we could follow those over time. And we specifically collected in February, because we know that Singapore spawns in March and April. So we wanted to go and specifically catch or collect gravid colonies. And so the idea of this is, can we ship very big colonies that are gravid over from Singapore back to London um, and then get them spawning in the system? And the idea behind that is that then marks, uh, you know that you've got gravid colony back um, so when you then pull them through the full reproductive cycle, you know that they have the capacity to spawn, and therefore it allows you to, to sort of study a little bit better. So this is James collecting, checking the colonies, and then these are the ewe sites, which are the eggs. We can see they're pink here. Uh, we set up a nursery um, for two weeks. They went on the nursery so they could heal before we shipped them. And then they were on these big polystyrene rafts. We spent a lot of money on freight, so there was one coral per box. Um, and then we got them back. This is well, this was a Mark II version of the system. Um, and 32 hours from literally collection from the reef back to London. So it was a very short window of time that we, uh, we managed to uh, streamline that process. Um, once you've got your broodstock colonies, and this is, if anyone takes a, wants to take a take-home message, I'm sure everyone is fragging their corals at home. I guarantee in this room there are people that have corals that are spawning. Um, you've just got to break them and have a look. So whenever you're doing a fragment to send to a friend or, or sell or whatever, just have a look through the cross-section. So this is a cross-section through the branch. And a croprids have um, very characteristic sort of development process. It takes between three, and, uh, three to four months for the eggs to develop. So you can start seeing it uh, quite a long time before the spawning happens. And so we have these small white eggs uh, here. They get a little bit larger. And when we get pigmented eggs here, we know that individual is going to spawn after the next full moon. Um, so then you can start focusing on which sort of day you need to start focusing on, uh, you know, collecting the gametes. And th this was just an example. We ran some histology. So once you've broken the branch, we, we fixed that, um, melted the calcium uh, skeleton away, um, and then put it in a wax block. You take fine slices off, stain up the material, and so these pink areas here are the eggs, and this purple area here is sperm. And so we can track what's called the gametogenic cycle um, as it goes along. Um, I've got a video to play now. Um, one of the things that we've learned over time is um, trying to shift the mindset from uh, the way that in situ spawning efforts work um, to the way we need to approach ex situ. And we need to um, not think about, so when you go out into the field to do um, in situ spawning, you obviously have no control, You're, you know when the window's time's happening, it's going to spawn at night, so you get all this concentrated effort at night, and it's tiring. These, these workshops, they sound brilliant, but they are really tiring. Um, I missed a spawn, one of my first um, spawns we had the opportunity, uh, because we had the mindset that we needed them spawning at night. Um, and what happens, we were ultimately working uh, about 10 days in a row, we still have to run a public aquarium. There's four of us uh, in my team, um, and we were just shattered. So we, we, we thought that we'd, we, uh, the spawn was going to happen the following month. We packed up shop on the Saturday night after 10 days of observation. The whole thing spawned on the Sunday. We missed it. And it was the most frustrating thing, but it was the, the most important learning curve we've ever had from this. And that is to say that we're putting all this effort into this data and, and controlling the environment. Why don't we just shift the spawn to work in our time? So now our corals spawn in the middle of the day for us. We fit them around our tea breaks, because the British, we need our tea breaks. Um, so our tenuous will spawn at half 11 in the morning for us. We then have our nice tea, and we have lunch, and then our meliopora spawns about half past one, our hyacinthus about half one. So we've just, and this is an aquaculture thing, you know, there's, Salmon spawning, you know, you don't wait until the, the wild time for it to spawn. You put an injection into it, you strip it out, have your tea, uh, do some fertilization, and then off you go. This is the same process. So in this video, um, you, you'll see the, the sort of process. And part of that, you need to block out that external light environment. So this is a generic sort of video of spawning. Um, we know the lunar cycle is the trigger. So we block out, uh, we create a double tent system so we're controlling this sort of light-dark environment. We use red light to look 
um, for this. This is called setting. So this is a process of the egg sperm bundles coming up into the mouth of the coral. And when you see setting, you know this individual is going to spawn. Um, so it starts off very slowly. Um, and then you sort of get this build-up in this crescendo of, of release of gametes. So we know the window of time um, that, that these individuals are going to spawn. So we turn off all the flow in the systems, and that allows the, um, the gametes to float uh, completely vertically up into the water column. And that means we can then uh, collect them in a very sort of planned and controlled way. Um, so these are not from different areas. This is sort of amalgamation of, of lots of different species that we've spawned. So an individual like this is probably this sort of size. We can get about maybe... Uh, 10, 10 to 15,000 eggs, something bigger like this, 200,000 eggs can be produced. And this is a very small um, window of time to get this gamete, these, these materials. So they can spawn anything from 15 to 40 minutes. And then that's it, once a year. So you need to know when this is happening. So what we do is we, uh, the bigger colonies, we'll, we'll chop the bottom off a washing up bowl. Uh, we just put a uh, floats over the top, and the idea is that contains that genetic material. And then this is replicating wave action, and then something called bundle disassociation. So this is the breaking apart of the uh, sperm coming out from the eggs. And then we extract the sperm from one individual, uh, and then we cross it with eggs from another. And this is the process of in vitro fertilization. And so then we have the sperm going into the egg, and then following that we have cell division. So this is a time lapse of about 12 hours of the early cell stages. Um, and this is all happening up in the ocean. The whole idea of this broadcast spawning is, and triggering at this mass release, they need to cross the eggs and sperm from each individual. So releasing all at the same time in these packages, the lipid-filled eggs take the package up to the surface. Um, then you have enzyme activity that breaks the bundle apart, but there's a delayed reaction. So from release, it can be 30 minutes to an hour, and that gives enough time for the slick to form, so ocean currents to mix it all together, and then uh, the cross-fertilization can occur. And so we just do that artificially. And so to date, we've, we've spawned uh, 18 species of acroperids. We've been focusing um, on acropora at the moment, but we'll, we'll start diversifying, I think, this year. Um, and really, the, the sort of initial part of the work is about creating a platform that so much more research can take place now. Um, so the initial focus was how do we do it in a planned way? And now I'm going to talk about some of the, the work that has led on from the back of that. So one of the things that I'm focusing on for my PhD is looking at embryogenesis. So uh, I took a whole bunch of samples from, from three different species and then did a load of scanning electron microscopy imaging. Um, to map out this, this uh, early stages. So this whole process is the bundle being released at the beginning right the way down to the planular larvae. And that's about a four-day process of the cells dividing to, to form that. When I took these images, something that um, I thought was pretty interesting, this is an aggregation of sperm cells on the outside. This is one egg, and you see a little clump here of sperm. Um, and I thought that was quite a, a, an interesting uh, process. So I wanted to delve into that a little bit more. So I took some more samples and used a different um, microscope technique called uh, confocal laser scanning microscopy. So um, the idea behind this technique is it, it, the microscope has uh, four uh, lasers at different wavelengths. And what we can then do is bolt on fluorescent markers onto the structure that we're interested in. And then we cross-reference that with the, the uh, wavelength of the laser. And that allows the structures to highlight. So what you're seeing here, uh, this is the egg sperm package, multiple eggs, and then these blue plumes coming out. I've used a, a DNA marker called DAPI, which is attached to the sperm, and then these are the sperm cells actually liberating out as the bundle's disassociating, so breaking apart. This bottom um, picture here, this, this is an Acropora meliopora uh, egg, uh, and it's four, uh, 30 minutes after I've mixed the sperm and egg together. So fertilization is occurring, and what we start seeing is some really interesting patterns of these aggregations of sperm. So again, every dot on there is marked up with this DAPI, so we're seeing the DNA of the, of the sperm. And we can create these 3D models, so we can start understanding the structure, 
um, and the relationship between the, the sperm and egg. This is something that I need to start working on a little bit more. This is now histology. So what you're seeing is a very fine slice through the egg. And what I've done is use um, three different fluorescent markers. So we've got the blue again showing the, the DNA. This is an aggregation of sperm cells. This whole red structure is a slice. You're looking through a cross section of the egg. So we've used red um, phyloidin, which has marked up the cytoskeleton. So it's kind of like the rebar of the, of the cell structure. And then using uh, alpha tubulin, this has marked up the microtubules in the sperm cells. So what you're seeing here is the tails of the sperm here. So I need to do a little bit more uh, work on this. What I want to try and look at is the relationship between um, these aggregations and where the nucleus is in the egg. I've not found the nucleus in the egg yet, so I'm, I've got a lot more histology to do on that. But it sort of gives you an example of the types of work that you can then do in an ex situ environment. Um, now leading on to grow out studies. Um, so it then creates a platform that just so many, so many experiments can take place on this. Um, we can track individuals over time. Um, you know, I'm not particularly focusing on this, but you know, you can do climate change research on this, do thermal stress experiments. There's, there's a whole world of opportunities. What I want to talk about here is something called allogeneic responses. This is another chapter of my, um, my PhD. And I think this could have a really interesting role in the aquarium trade. So what happens once you've got this larvae, they settle onto the reef and form a polyp. Often the larvae aggregate together into clumps. So what you're seeing here is five uh, polyps. These are all genetically different. So they've come from different polyps that have all settled together and aggregated. Uh, and this is a copper hyacinthus. And we start seeing some really interesting interactions. So we see uh, polyp number two, three, and five have fused together to form something called a trichimera. So this is one entity, but with three genetic uh, components to it. Polyp one and two are rejecting. We see this boundary layer. And the same with three and four, this boundary layer. Now, as this plays out and the, the, um, this, you know, this group of five polyps grow, it may be that uh, polyp number one is the most dominant and it's gonna kill the other four as things go on. It's gonna start stinging them and killing them. It may be that four is dominant or it may be that the trichimera is dominant. Now this is really important when we start thinking about how do we upscale, because we need to understand how we can maximize survivorship. As we follow this through, here's some examples of Acropora tenuis and Meliopora. So we have two different genetic entities here. Uh, we have the, the sort of brown uh, uh, genotype and then a purple genotype. And we've got fusion, so this has now formed a bichimera. Um, they're uh, genetically still enough that they'll grow as one entity. In the Meliopora here, we have the same. We've got fusion, but then uh, these, these two uh, colonies here, uh, we've got competition, but it's non-aggressive competition. We've got a little bit of grow out here, but they're not stinging each other. Um, now, as we follow that forward, um, looking at this Acropora tenuous, this is really exciting. So what's happened in this bichimera, where a polyp has grown on the boundary, where the two genotypes have uh, fused, a single polyp grew up on that boundary, and it's expressing uh, the two different genotypes down a single branch. And then it started bleeding out through the colonies. Now this is mega for the industry, right? <laughs> so there's lots of possibilities here to understand allogeneic responses. Here's the Meliopora, where we've got a non-aggressive, uh, two genotypes living alongside each other. Then uh, another possibility is looking at hybridization. So why don't, um, there are mechanisms that minimize hybridization, but hybridization does occur. And um, anyone that saw Charlie Veron's talk last night, this whole sort of movement of a syngamian, what is a species, um, is a continuation of time. So one of the things I started playing around with is actually mixing and matching the species. And I've done about 80 different genetic crosses now where I take eggs from one individual species and I try and mix it with sperm from a different. And what you find when you mix pure species is there's differences in fertilization success. And it's no different to humans. Some people are just more compatible and can have babies easier. Other people have to go down the IVF route. We see exactly the same thing with corals. When we take pure crosses of sperm from one individual and cross it with eggs from another, sometimes we get great fertilization, sometimes we get lower. When you then take that out to hybridization, it just exacerbates that. Sometimes it works really well, other times it doesn't work at all. What we're finding is Meliopora is the dirty girl of the reef. 
So all sperm seem to fertilize meliopora eggs. Um, but it doesn't happen all the, way, all, all, the, uh, all the way around. So sometimes it might not work at all. And so we're documenting these sort of different genetic crosses um, to see possibilities with that. And it's more for a bit of fun, really. Um, so this is all great. We can produce corals. We can settle them. Now the biggest challenge, and this is a big challenge for restoration, how do we turn those millions of larvae we're producing that we're settling and creating hundreds of thousands of coral, how do we, in a year's time, turn that into tens of thousands of corals that can be transplanted out? And this is the area that we need to focus on uh, the, the most. And it's largely down to benthic competition. So what we know is uh, coralline algae provides the trigger for settlement. And it, there's still some debate whether it's the algae or a bacterial community living on the algae. But the, many of these coralline algae species do not want a coral growing on top of them. So when they settle, there's lots of different responses that the coralline algae can uh, sort of kick in. Uh, some can release mucus sloths to just chuck the, the corals away. Others actively engulf, and it happens rapidly. What's this, uh, like a two, three week window and the coralline algae is just completely enveloped. We have different uh, coralline algae uh, that cause these problems, Fil filamenta uh, filamentous algae, uh, swamp and kill. That leads to increased sedimentation, which uh, really affects the coral around the base. It can lead to more cyano outbreaks. And this is all driving this sort of high mortality that we see in early settled corals. So I started thinking about um, urchins are brilliant grazers. They graze on all of these. The problem is, Adult urchins are very indiscriminate in the way they graze. They have this rasping action. It's very damaging. And it's known that they can kill baby corals because these things are about a millimeter across. But what I want to look at is for every big urchin you see on the reef, there is going to be thousands of babies. It's just no one is looking at this role that microherbivory is playing. And arguably, it's probably playing as much of a role as the, uh, the adult urchins. Uh, it's just they're so small you can't see them. So I wanted to start looking at microherbivory, so whether these baby urchins can work their way around the corals, control the algae, but not damage the coral. So I started, um, yeah, okay, this works. Um, I had a plan spawning in November last year, and I just simply started working backwards using Skip Moe's uh, technique of, of uh, inducing the urchin spawn. So I'm working with Trypnuces, uh, sorry, um, Mespilia globulus, the tuxedo urchin, so using a temperature shock, uh, induced the spawning of the urchin. Um, that gave me enough time to work out the larval uh, process of, of uh, growing the baby urchins. I could then settle the urchins, grow them out for about a month and a half, and so they were the right size that it would then correlate with the, the spawn of, the, uh, of the, the coral. And then what I've run is an experiment where I've looked at different densities of urchins, um, with a fixed number of, of corals, and then I recorded the sort of survivorship of those corals over time. Um, and this, is, this, this was painstaking work. So I had about 5,000 corals settled uh, in four different treatments. So I had a low grazing density, a medium grazing density, and high grazing density of these baby urchins, and my control was a negative control. So I, I had no grazing. I wanted to see the sort of mortality that you get of the corals. And so every week I took out, um, I had 18 uh, plugs uh, for each treatment, and I replicated those treatments um, six times. So I had 24 tanks with all these baby corals in. And I took them out and I counted these 5,000 uh, 5, baby corals every week, and then tracked out uh, the, this survivorship curve over six months. Um, and so what we see here, this is the red line, this is my control, where we're having lots of algae overgrowing, killing the corals and then different densities of urchins. So what we find is that the more urchins we put in, the higher the survivorship we get of the corals. And we can see, not only do we get a higher survivorship, we actually get much bigger corals as a result of it. So it's quite difficult to see, but they, this is the coral here. So the tiny still, these are just the regular frag plugs that we use. Um, so not only do we get this low survivorship, we end up with a small coral at the end of it because they're fighting this, this um, benthic competition. When the urchins are in there, look how clean that plug is. You know, the urchins are just doing the job for you. Uh, but it then allows the coral to grow and just get into its space and just grow as, as unimpeded as possible. And so I think this has a huge amount to play and role to play in restoration as we move forward. Can we start thinking about multi-taxa restorations and not just putting corals in, but if we start spawning the urchins, we can put different important trophic groups together to maximize the benefit. 
And so we've started working at now with um, other species of urchins, and Martin's been uh, sort of hugely helpful in, in uh, you know, teaching us what we've got to uh, look for. So this was shot actually last week. This is the first run that we've done with diadema. We can't get Caribbean species, so we're, we're using Indo-Pacific. But the idea is that we can work on techniques and, and give that out to partners that, are, that you know, have vested interests in different areas of the world. And we then want to start working with Tripnuces as well. I had one attempt last year and it, it, uh, after 14 days in work. I think now we've got the process sorted, we, we should be able to sort this species out. And this is sort of getting me speculating that if you have an aquaculture situation or a restoration process, that um, you look at this microbivory and this co-culturing, there will be a tipping point when the urchin gets so big and it starts causing damage. Tripnuces could become a really important way that we could bring income into restoration. If the tripnuces were to be used in microherbivory, increasing the coral survivorship, when it becomes too big, could you move that into a secondary aquaculture facility, grow that out for human consumption, for sushi industry, and bring money then into restoration so you can increase your survivorship of the corals, so you reduce the cost of that coral going out to the reef, and then you can bring an income into restoration, further reducing the cost of of each individual unit that goes out. And this could link in with sea cores, tile work. Uh, you know, all of these factors can hopefully play a role that upscaling is, is, is potentially there. Um, how long have I got? Am I waffling on? Eight minutes, okay. Um, when you get me going, I can't shut up. Um, so this, this is my corridor. Um, I don't have a lot of space. I'm in a 115-year-old building. We're not putting an extension on that. It's a listed building. So while we can do some great stuff here, it really needs partners to take that on and, and really explode it up. And so I'm gonna go and talk now about a partnership that we've got with Florida Aquarium. So Florida approached me two years ago. They'd heard about the work and they said, look, we wanna get involved in this. Uh, we wanted to do a partnership with Project Coral. Um, they've been working with uh, asexual fragmentation and then for about the last sort of seven years with sexual reproduction for, for restoration purposes. Um, and they are really serious about this. They are really gearing up their efforts to support restoration work. They have built a new site. Uh, it's a 22-acre site just south of the, the main aquarium on Apollo Beach uh, called the Center for Conservation. And it's dedicated to Caribbean restoration and species res restoration. Um, so far, they have two of these very large greenhouses. These are acting like a genetic repository for uh, the genotypes of, of corals along the, the Florida reef tract. And so they're, they're bringing genotypes into here to, uh, to act as a safety net. And then this building here, um, this is um, working with uh, Diadema. There's a turtle rehab building in there. And this is the site where we're doing our, our Project Coral um, partnership. Um, Kerry O'Neill, uh, she oversees uh, the, the husbandry uh, at the Center for Conservation, and she's the unicorn of corals. She's amazing. This, this. Uh, this is some of the corals that she produced from in situ spawning last year. This is a year's growth of a cropper or cervicorn. It's critically endangered species, and they are having incredible success. These are a cropper palmata. Each one of these is a separate genetic entity. They're arguing there's probably more genetic material in this one tank now than left on the, the Florida reef track, which is insane. And this is from one spawn, one in situ spawn. We want to ramp this up massively. So the, there's so far two of these glass houses. There will ultimately be eight. So these are going to act as a grow out facility, but also holding uh, this genetic material. And then these are pictures that Kerry sent me last week. They're now installing four of the Project Coral um, systems into here. And our goal is to start bringing brood stock in probably early next year. Um, and then we're going to phase shift the whole environment. So we can not just have one spawning a year. We can have it in a very co controlled way in our tea breaks around that. Um, no you know, night dives, getting battered by storms, tea breaks. And we're just shifting all of that environmental parameters by three months. So we get three, uh, four systems uh, staggered by four months. And the goal from 2020 will phase shift in 2000 the next year. But the goal, I think, from 2020 is we can hopefully have four spawnings a year, four times the access to material, and can we upscale uh, these, these efforts. Linked into this, but, but separate, um, is a study that um, my, uh, my, uh, one of my supervisors, James Guest here, 
Uh, James has worked with restoration for about 20 years. Um, he is the, the sort of leader on Coral Assist, which is a program, five-year funded program. He works out of Newcastle University, but the work we're doing is out in Palau. And it's looking at something called um, assisted gene flow or sele and selective breeding. So can we start producing hardier corals that can withstand climate change? So this is a, a proof of, of concept. There's five years of, of funding work on this. Um, James is looking at different geographical environments. So this is a very exposed reef. He's looking at four, uh, three species of coral. Um, a Cropra digitifera, uh, a Kynopora uh, lemulosa, and a Goni Goniastria species. So very different environments, very exposed, clean uh, sort of uh, wave environment, uh, but then very turbid, murky waters. This is Rison Bay, so very different types of corals in these different habitats. What James and, and the team have done is tagged 100 colonies um, of each species. And then samples have been taken from all of those 100 colonies. And then thermal stress experiments have been run. So that's created um, an idea of which ones are thermally tolerant, which ones aren't thermally tolerant. And then we've selectively bred those, grown those out, and now they're being transplanted onto the reef. So in five years' time, when they spawn, we can then mix and create F2 generation and follow the genetic um, profile of multiple generations. So there's a lot of proteomics work, understanding the influence of the microbiome as part of that. So this is really exciting work and it will feed into the restoration efforts. Um, so in summary, we can spawn broadcast corals now. Um, the Center for Conservation at Florida Aquarium are, are taking this and, and blowing it up and I'm so pleased to see this now um, having real world value. That's the whole idea of it. Um, and then I think co-culturing, we need to explore these kind of mechanisms a lot more. Um, I need to thank a lot of people. Uh, that it, it literally wouldn't be possible without the support of corporate partners, scientific partners, funding bodies, individuals. I need to thank my team at the Horniman Museum who work so hard. There's only four of us. We're trying to spread ourselves pretty thin at times. It gets a little bit hectic, but it's, um, yeah, I need to thank all these people. Um, if you want to follow any information, there's some stuff on our website. I set up a captive coral spawning Facebook page. Put pictures on if you're getting spawning. You know, we need more information about this. That's my Twitter handle. Um, I need to thank Mazna um, for um, you know, voting me as the, the actress of the year. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for listening for me and my little Acropora Emiliapora friend, Embryo, here. Thank you. Thank you.